Welcome everyone to our 17th and final meeting of our 2021 Fabric Community Virtual Meeting Series. Series. It's so glad to I'm so glad to have you all with us. And tonight we have the pleasure of having Dr. Gwen Sklute talk about uh, pulmonary involvement in Fabric disease, and that's something that um, we really need uh, some more discussion about and some more education about because. It's, as uh, Dr. Sklut will probably tell you, it's a, a very overlooked and probably undertreated um, manifestation of Fabry disease. So I'm going to give, Dawn is going to be here. Dawn is normally for all of you that have been to uh, several of these, you'll know Dawn usually um, kicks off uh, the presentation by uh, reading uh, or talking about Dr. Sklut's bio and she's gonna be here a little bit later. So. I'll do that tonight. And then as usual, we'll have the presentation, some questions and answers, a, um, a um, prize drawing announcements and a prize drawing at the end. So thank you again, um, everyone for being here. So Dr. Sklute is, this is a uh, interesting story to me that she um, worked at Mount Sinai in New York City for 25 years. And she, a year ago, has um, gone to industry. And although she's not, her job in, in uh, industry isn't directly related to Fabre, she's working with Kiesi, who is, as most of you know, um, is waiting approval for their enzyme replacement therapy. So she's in a different department, but some uh, in a place that's uh, close to home for us. So um, this is just great to have Dr. Sklut with us with her vast experience and um, education and experience in some mu much of it uh, directly related to Fabry disease. So I'll give you, um, you can read Dr. Sklut's full bio in the um, speakers and bio section on the registration website. And I'll just give you a few, um, a, a little bit of a, a taste of it. So she's board certified um, in pulmonology and critical care. And she joined Kiesi in just January of 2021 as a clinical research physician and clinical program lead in the global clinical in global clinical development. So she's more doing more research and uh, and uh, new and drug development and that sort of thing. And prior, she had 25 years at, as I mentioned in uh, academic pulmonology medicine at the ICANN School of Medicine in Mount Sinai, New York. And you know, we all have a, or many of us have a strong connection to Mount Sinai also from the days when, you know, when you know Dr. Desnick was running around the country, and in my case, uh, he drew my blood first blood sample in the airport at Detroit Metro as we passed by and took it back to Mount Sinai with him. So uh, Mount Sinai has, has had um, one of the longest and um, largest fabric disease programs in the country. Just an aside, this isn't part of Dr. Sklut's uh, <laughs> bio, but um, her research expertise primarily focused on airway disease as well as pulmonary physiology. And she had a large practice in, uh, at Mount Sinai. She participated in clinical trials and related to asthma and COPD, which is something we want to learn more about, and um, was funded to characterize pulmonary manifestations of Fabry disease. So she's published numerous articles and uh, publications and has been invited to, to talk widely about her, her um, specialty area. And she um, started out uh, with a degree from Johns Hopkins, went to uh, Medi or New York University and finished her fellowship at Johns Hopkins also. And she's a native New Yorker. And although I don't know, uh, we'll see how we, uh, if we can tell that in her as she speaks to us, but welcome Dr. Sklut and thank you so much for giving us an, uh, some uh, education on pulmonary involvement in Fabry disease. Thank you uh, for that introduction, uh, Jerry, and thank you so much for um, inviting me to speak. Now I'm going to be conscious of any accent that I might have that might give away the fact that I'm indeed a native uh, New Yorker. Um, so mm -hmm. I have um, a disclosure that I need to just read. 
Um, the views and opinions expressed in this presentation are those of my own and do not reflect the standards or practices at my employer, KZ USA. And this presentation is for informational purposes only. So that is my company disclosure. I also have a disclaimer for this talk. And that is that we are adrift in relatively unchartered waters. And I say that referring to pulmonary involvement in Fabry disease, because the literature is really very scant on this topic. And what you find are case reports or case series and really very little in terms of prospective studies. What I'm going to try to do tonight is to give us a compass so that we could at least start to navigate our way in this uh, rather murky topic. So this is a list of the major concepts that I will discuss today. And uh, we will start with the fact that uh, Jerry hinted to it, that lung involvement is often overlooked in Fabry disease. And I will um, emphasize that with a case presentation. Just wanna get myself a pointer here. Um, so this case is actually a, a, a woman that I took care of when I was still at Mount Sinai, a 21-year-old non-smoking woman who was diagnosed with Febre at age 17. Um, she complained of exertional dyspnea or shortness of breath for three years. At rest, she had no shortness of breath at all. She had no coughing, wheezing, or chest tightness. She had a comprehensive cardiology evaluation. Everything was normal. She also had normal laboratory values. The cardiologist gave her the diagnosis of deconditioning, which means basically that she was told that she was out of shape. Well, her very astute geneticist thought it might be a good idea to refer her to pulmonary. And so I uh, was lucky enough to see the patient. I'm happy to see the patient. Um, in addition to taking a history and doing a physical, I ordered routine lung function testing, which was normal. I ordered a chest radiograph, which was also normal. So then I ordered some advanced uh, pulmonary function testing, which I'll share with you now. So I did a test known as impulse oscillometry. And this is a lung function test that requires no effort on the part of the patient. They just breathe very quietly through a tube. And the signal that actually come, comes back from the lungs can give information about the large airways and the small airways separately. And this test indicated that there was dysfunction of the small airways. And this uh, picture here is an example of a typical oscillometry device. This handle detaches and the patient is able to hold it and just breathe through this mouthpiece. So a very portable uh, device, but packed with information. I also ordered a bicycle cardiopulmonary exercise test since the patient's shortness of breath occurred with exercise. And this type of test tells you if exercise capacity is normal or reduced. And if it's reduced, it can tell you what system is limiting the exercise. Is it the heart? Is it the lungs? Is it the muscles? Are you out of shape? Or is it any combination? And in this patient, it turned out that the lungs were limiting her. And uh, the test results showed what we refer to as a reduced ventilatory reserve or breathing reserve. Now, this is obviously not a picture of the patient since I said that uh, the patient is a female, but it just, I'm showing it to show you uh, how the exercise uh, setup looks. So patient rides a stationary bicycle, they're breathing and all the air that they exhale is collected, but they are having their blood pressure monitored and they're hooked up to an electrocardiogram. And all of this information is fed in an integrated way into a computer. So at this point I had ordered a CAT scan of the chest on the patient to look for more subtle evidence of lung disease, but unfortunately the patient did not return for follow-up. 
So what can we learn from this case? What are the pearls? So symptoms of pulmonary disease in Fabry may be subtle and misdiagnosis is not uncommon. Referral to a pulmonary specialist is often initially overlooked. And finally, more sophisticated pulmonary testing may be helpful for patient evaluation if routine testing is normal. So I'm going to turn now to the next point and give you a little bit of a historical perspective because this goes quite far back. So Dr. Fabry's original patient in 1930 was described as having, quote unquote, frequent colds and influenza, productive sputum and asthmatic trouble and may have died due to respiratory complications. Over the next um, several decades, there were um, histological descriptions from biopsies and sadly sometimes from autopsies. So initially there was a description of this so-called pre peculiar precipitate, uh, which in the lungs, which was subsequently identified as glycosphingolipid. And um, as I'll show you, this could deposit in a variety of different places, but some studies noted thickening of the bronchial and pulmonary vessel walls with hypertrophy or enlargement of the smooth muscle. And in spite of this accumulating histologic evidence, little attention was paid to the clinical or functional impact of these findings. So the next important question I thought we should ask is what is the suspected mechanism by which Fabry disease impacts the lung? <clears throat> so you've heard talks on renal disease, kidney disease, the heart and the brain. And in the lungs, it's a, a similar pathophysiology in that there's a deficiency of the lysosomal enzyme alpha-galactosidase A with progressive accumulation of the glycosphingolipids, uh, predominantly or prominently GB3. And the accumulation of the glycosphingolipids can lead to organ dysfunction. And tonight we're talking about the lung. So this is uh, an open lung uh, biopsy um, specimen from a patient with Fabry disease in the top two pictures. This is a lower power view in the microscope. This is a higher power view. And the bottom, you're looking at a control patient who underwent open lung biopsy for another reason, but did not have Fabry disease. And what the arrow is pointing to is thickening of the bronchial wall smooth muscle. You can see it better on this high power view. And you notice that that is not the case in the control uh, slide. And just to orient you, uh, this is, uh, these are actually cilia, the little hairs that line the, the bronchial um, tube. Um, it's like the, the airway epithelium. And then underneath it, you have various layers, including the smooth muscle. So thickening of the bronchial wall smooth muscle. This is another um, example. In this case, this is an electron micrograph also from an open lung biopsy from a patient with Fabry disease. And here, the arrow is showing sphingolipid deposition in a pulmonary epithelial cell. So this next slide I adapted uh, from a publication by Favario uh, showing the places where glycosphingolipid can uh, deposit or accumulate in the lung. Um, so it can accumulate in the upper airway, the trachea, and that leads to a, a higher prevalence of sleep disorder breathing or sleep apnea in Fabry disease compared to the general population. That won't be the focus of my talk tonight. That could be a talk unto itself. Most commonly though, the glycosphingolipid deposits in the breathing tubes, in the airways, in the larger airways, 
and in the smaller airways, especially um, in the smaller airways at first. And this can lead to narrowing of the airways, as we'll see. Um, over here, you see that the glycosphingolipid can deposit in the walls of the blood vessels. Um, and this can lead to thickening of the walls and narrowing of the blood vessels. More anecdotally, it's thought, and I'll show you some examples of this, that the glycosphingolipid can deposit in the lung tissue. So not in the actual breathing tubes, but in the tissue around the breathing tubes. So I thought before we got into what you can anticipate seeing in Fabry disease, it might be helpful to review normal lung structure and function. So we'll go through a, a series of pictures to uh, make these points. So this was, I thought, a very nice uh, picture that I found. And it's sh showing um, the lung in relationship to the heart. You see the, the two lungs. You can see the windpipe, the trachea, and it divides into two bronchi and then subdivides into smaller and smaller breathing tubes. You could see the close proximity of the breathing tubes to the arteries and to uh, the venous system. But let's look at this sort of in a magnified view now. So here in this picture, we're looking at a smaller airway, the so-called bronchial, and you can see it's going to subdivide further. And then when we get way out in the periphery of the lung, we get to the actual alveoli. And this is where gas exchange occurs, where oxygen goes in and where carbon dioxide goes out. If you look on the right side of this slide, you can see how the blood vessels are intimately related to the alveoli. And the exact site of gas exchange are these capillaries, which are the very smallest blood vessels. So again, oxygen goes in from the alveoli into the capillaries, and then ultimately is distributed to the organs. The capillaries are the site of gas exchange. And this picture is a little bit different. It's showing you a bronchus or breathing tube and a pulmonary artery, but in cross section, um, and I'm showing you this slide because I wanted you to see that these structures, these tubes have a wall to them. So if a glycosphingolipid deposits in this wall, you could see that it might thicken and narrow the airway and might narrow the pulmonary uh, vasculature. So now I'm going to talk about normal lung function. So first a picture which is typical of what you would see in any pulmonary function laboratory. And um, the patient is sitting in what's called a body plethysmograph. You can see he's breathing through a tube. He's wearing nose clips. When the, the door is open, um, the test that is commonly done is called spirometry, which I'll talk about in a moment. And when the door is closed, you can measure lung volumes, or the exact amount of air in the lungs, and you can measure gas exchange, which I talked to you about. So let's look at that in a little more detail. So spirometry, and I'm hoping that many of you are familiar with this test, is a test where you take a deep breath all the way in, and then you blast your air out hard and fast. And what you see is this curve of exhalation with air coming out, rapidly rising to a peak, and in this healthy individual, descending at about a 45 degree angle to the end point here. From this spirometry, you can measure what's called the force vital capacity, or the FVC, and that's the total amount of air that you exhale. You can also measure what's called the FEV1, or the forced expiratory volume in one second, the amount of air that comes out in one second. I put this little insert here for myself showing the um, bronchial tree with the airways getting smaller and smaller to remind me to tell you that from spirometry, you can also get a measure of small airways function called the FEF2575. 
It stands for the forced expiratory flow over 25 to 75% of the vital capacity. And it's a marker of small airways function. You can also measure lung volumes, as I said, with the body plethysmograph. And for our purposes tonight, the most important concepts are the total lung capacity and the residual volume. So if you were to take a deep breath all the way in, you would be at your total lung capacity. So that's one of the measurements that's made. If you then breathed out completely as much as you could, the lungs are not like balloons, so they don't collapse. There's a certain amount of air that doesn't come out. That's known as the residual volume. And you can think of it as air that's trapped inside. Everyone has some, some people have more than others. The final test I wanted to, to, measure, to mention is the gas exchange testing. And we come back to another picture of the alveolus and the blood capillary. Because as I mentioned, this is the site of gas exchange, oxygen in, carbon dioxide out. And this test is called diffusing capacity or DLCO for short. So I believe I have one more explanatory slide. So what I show you here are representative spirograms in health and disease. So um, in the middle, you are looking at a normal uh, spirogram. It's called a flow volume loop. And now I'm showing you inspiration, which is below the x-axis, as well as expiration. So in this healthy individual, they take, take a deep breath all the way in. And at this point right here, they're at their total lung capacity. They then exhale, uh, flow rises rapidly to a peak. And as I mentioned, it descends back to this point where they've emptied all the air out that they can, and they're now at their relative residual volume. In this person, the amount of air that comes out, the force vital capacity is normal. The amount that comes out in the first second is also normal. Let's look on the right at a loop that uh, gives an example of someone with obstructive lung disease. Notice the scooped out appearance of the exhalation part of the loop. Now you see here that the FEV1, or the amount that comes out in the first second, is disproportionately decreased relative to the force vital capacity. Why is that? Well, if you opened your mouth wide and you blew out, I think you'd agree with me that you would get your air out much faster than if you blew out through a straw. People with obstructive lung disease are essentially breathing out through a straw. So the amount of air that comes out in the first second is going to be reduced relative to the total amount that comes out. And if you took the ratio of the FEV1 over the FVC, that ratio would be reduced. And that's the hallmark of obstructive lung disease that we'll come back to shortly. I wanted to mention restrictive lung disease. It's less common in Fabry disease, but it can be seen. Sometimes it's seen in conjunction with obstruction, but basically you'll notice that it's a smaller loop and both the FEV1 and the FVC are decreased. So you may be wondering now, how do I know if my lungs are affected by, by Fabry disease and how common is Fabry lung disease? So let's talk about that. Well, a pulmonary evaluation, I believe is very important in Fabry disease. And I think that everyone with Fabry disease should have an annual pulmonary evaluation, just like you have your heart checked, you have your kidneys checked and so forth. The pulmonologist will take a complete pulmonary history, will find out about other lung diseases such as asthma, will ask if you smoke, as an example, they'll question you about symptoms of shortness of breath, cough, wheezing, chest tightness. These are the most common symptoms. Much less commonly, patients may cough up blood, but this is really a rare symptom. They will perform lung function testing, starting with the routine ones that I just explained to you. They will likely do a chest x-ray. And if like the patient that I told you about, your symptoms are only with exercise, they may consider a cardiopulmonary exercise test. I wanted just to point out 
that sputum analysis, collection of your phlegm when you cough, um, that is then analyzed, and bronchoscopy, where a scope is placed um, through the vocal cords into the windpipe and down into the airways, can be done, but are only done for research purposes. And when they have been done, they've been able to show uh, glycosphingolipid um, in, in the sputum and also on samples collected from bronchoscopy. And I wanted also to mention that pulmonary disease may coexist with heart disease and the symptoms of both may be similar. So you should be checked for both. So I'd like to turn now to lung function evaluation in Fabry disease. And I just reiterate that in terms of prospective studies, there are very, very few. So I, I put together what I could, but the, the information, as you'll see, gives a broad range of results. But some major points do come across. And that is, first, that small airways disease may be the first abnormality that's noted if it's caught early. And sometimes in women who tend to present later than men, this may be the only defect that is seen. Airflow obstruction is the most common abnormality. You'll see from um, the percentages that there's a wide range of what's reported in prospective studies. But airflow obstruction is thought to be about 10 times more common in patients with Fabre than in the general population. And as I'll show you, obstruction is age dependent and increases with age. Lung hyperinflation, which means too much air in the lungs or an increased total lung capacity and decreased gas exchange may be noted. Now, perhaps you're thinking, why is it bad to have too much air in your lungs? Well, it's bad because in the setting of obstruction or narrowed airways, that excess air gets trapped there and your lungs then mechanically don't function the way that they should. Interestingly, some patients who have airflow obstruction actually show reversibility. And by that, I mean, when they're given an asthmatic inhaler, albuterol, which relaxes airway smooth muscle, that obstruction can improve. Now, I find this fascinating. In asthma, it's very obvious to me why airflow obstruction would improve with a medicine that relaxes smooth muscle, because the smooth muscle tightens in asthma. Why the airflow obstruction might be reversible in Fabre when the airway narrowing is presumably due to accumulation of glycosphingolipid in the airway wall is not clear to me. But this has been reported in 30 to 63% of cases, depending upon who you read. So uh, this is a table from a paper by Franzen and colleagues published in 2013. And actually it's a compilation of different studies here. So we're going to focus on the total, which was 272 individuals with Fabry disease. And we're going to uh, highlight the information uh, within the, the red uh, rectangles. I hope nobody's colorblind. Um, so the FEV1 to FVC ratio in this compilation of studies was reduced in one third of the population of 272 individuals. So one third had airflow obstruction as defined in this study. The FEV1, the amount of air exhaled in the first second was reduced in almost half of the population. Um, the FEF 2575 that I mentioned was a marker of small airways disease was reduced in 44%. There was less of a, of a problem with gas exchange here occurring in only 16% of the population. And women, um, the data is not shown, that they developed obstruction later than men but when they did develop it, in many cases, it was as severe as in uh, the male counterparts. And one third to one half of these individuals had cough, shortness of breath, and wheezing that was attributable to airflow obstruction. 
So uh, this is uh, a graph that uh, I took from another publication in 2006, and it's demonstrating the re relationship between airflow obstruction and age. So I mentioned that airflow obstruction increases with age. So I want to walk you through the slide so that you're not confused because these lines seem to be going down. So on the y-axis here, you're looking at the FEV1 to FVC ratio. That's the hallmark of obstruction. The, the lower the ratio is, the worse, the worse it is. The open circles represent the males, the pluses represent the females. You're looking at age on the x-axis. And what you can see is that the FEV1 to FEC ratio is decreasing with age, meaning that obstruction is increasing and is getting worse and is present more. And you see that it seems to be more in males. There's a steeper decline of the ratio than in females in this particular example. So this is another study. Uh, and this was a perspective study published in 2017 by Franzen. It was a 16 year longitudinal follow-up study of 95 patients with Fabry disease. And again, we're going to be focusing on the information within the rectangle because that is actually looking um, at all of the risk factors for airflow obstruction uh, and FEV1 decline when taken together, analyzed together. Um, and what they found is that the predictors that were significant were age, older age, male sex, and smoking. Nothing else uh, was reached significance in this uh, analysis, although enzyme replacement therapy uh, came very close to significant. And uh, this was a, another uh, publication by friends in a year later, using the same uh, cohort studied longitudinally, but here looking at a subpopulation of 53 individuals. And here he was looking at those with the classic phenotype versus the late onset phenotype in terms of these age-related increases in airflow obstruction. And it's showing us that it varies by phenotype. So again, you're looking at the FEV1 to FVC ratio, a mark of obstruction versus age. Males are shown by this greenish blue color, females by the red uh, color. And you can see that as before, uh, with, with the classic phenotype, there is a decline in the ratio with age, meaning more obstruction, worse obstruction. There's really a paucity of data in the late onset phenotype. So I don't even know that I want to comment on this, only to say that it, it doesn't appear in this small group uh, that there is a significant obstruction noted uh, with age. And I will say that in this study, that the FEV1 to FVC ratio um, correlated strongly with the levels of GB3. So the more GB3 that there was, the more increased obstruction there was. So I'm going to turn now to chest imaging in Fabry disease. And to help orient us, I show you on the slide a normal chest x-ray. So this is the heart. These, this is the diaphragm, so the left and the right. Th these are, are the lungs. You can kind of make out the ribs here. This is the collarbone. So the typical x-ray that you might see in somebody with Fabry disease who had bad obstructive lung disease is what's shown here. Now, what is the difference? These lungs are filled with a great amount of air, more than normal. This is what I mentioned earlier as hyperinflation. There's too much air in the lungs. I don't know if you could tell, but the diaphragms are a bit flattened. They're pushed down mechanically by all of this extra air. And that definitely puts this patient at a disadvantage in terms of being able to breathe comfortably. So that is what you would more often see. 
a less common pattern is what is shown here. This is a female patient, as you can, you can see. And I think you can see that the lung volumes, the amount of air in the lungs here is decreased. So this is an example of restrictive lung disease. And it's due to, if you can see these white uh, lines here and here and on this side, it's due to interstitial lung disease. So we're pre presumably due to glycosphingolipid depositing in the lung tissue rather than in the breathing tubes. So a very important question that uh, you might be asking is, can therapy for Fabry disease help my lungs? Um, I will say that there really were no studies that I could find on chaperone therapy and lung function. So my comments are going to be limited to enzyme replacement therapy. So this is uh, from the same publication uh, by Franzen published in 2018. And what they're looking at is the age at initiation of enzyme replacement therapy at ER, uh, of ERT. Um, and you're looking at the FEV1 on the y-axis versus age. And there are three lungs. This, this line, which is red, uh, was initiation of the ERT when uh, patients were younger than 35. This line in green, the age was 35 to 45. And this line in blue was age greater than 46. And what you can see is that the line that doesn't show a decline in FEV1, that actually shows um, stability over time, is with initiation of ERT in the youngest patients, those under 35. So early initiation of ERT can slow lung function decline and can even stabilize uh, lung function decline as shown here and in other studies that I looked at. This I thought was a fascinating um, paper, it's a case report of a patient who had a CAT scan of the chest in November of 2002, prior to starting enzyme replacement therapy. So to orient you to the CAT scan, so this is the, the front of the chest, this is the back of the chest, you see the lungs, you see the uh, vascular structures that will lead into the heart, this is the, the airway, the two bronchi, the right bronchus, the left bronchus. This little hole here is the esophagus. And what you notice is that there's a lot of white. And in this patient, uh, that was interstitial lung disease, which I've already told you is less common. These sort of, uh, these lines are normal blood vessels. So that's normal. This round structure is a blood vessel that you're looking at in cross sections, how to sort of cut, and you're looking at it on, on end. I also want you to notice these very black structures. You might think that they're normal, but they're actually too, too black. So this patient had a mix of interstitial lung disease and small airways obstruction. What's interesting is what happened post enzyme replacement therapy in June 2004, you can see that the interstitial lung disease has really virtually completely resolved. What remained is what we refer to in pulmonary and in radiology as a mosaic pattern with some areas of relative blackness, other areas of relative whiteness. And what that tells us was that there was still some small airways disease. But this patient really dramatically improved. And it turned out that her symptoms dramatically improved as well, as did her lung function. There was very little information out there on what enzyme replacement therapy might do to exercise capacity. So I show you uh, one study that I was able to find that can give us some insight. So this obviously was a very small study. There were only um, six patients with Fabry disease. Two patients received placebo. That's shown by the dashed line. Four patients received enzyme replacement, shown by the solid line. 
On the y-axis, you're looking at something called oxygen consumption, which is the key thing that you look at, which gives you a global assessment of exercise capacity. And we're looking at it at baseline before they started enzyme replacement therapy and then post-therapy. I believe this was about 18 months later, although the patients had an exercise test every three months. If you look at it, you don't see much response in the patients who got placebo. You don't see anything of note. In the four patients who actually received enzyme replacement therapy, you could see that the exercise capacity improved in three of the four patients, very notably in this one patient. Now, one of these patients was found to have a reduction in exercise capacity due to a lung problem. I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that that is um, signified by a reduced ventilatory reserve. And this patient actually normalized their ventilatory reserve uh, after enzyme replacement therapy. So I'd like at this point to summarize and give you some take home messages. So the lung is, often and unfortunately overlooked in Fabry disease. Breathing problems may be attributed to heart disease or simply to being out of shape. GP3 can deposit in the lungs, leading to symptoms and leading to physiologic and radiographic abnormalities. Enzyme replacement therapy may slow progression of lung disease. Annual pulmonary evaluation should be strongly considered, I believe. Clearly, more research on Fabry disease and the lung is, is needed desperately. And my last piece of advice, and I would give this to everyone, but uh, especially to those with Fabry disease tonight, is not to smoke because smoking can lead to obstructive lung disease. So you don't want to have that as an added factor. So I've tried in this talk to shed some light on a topic that's still not well understood. Uh, I hope that I've helped you navigate the waters as much as we can. And I would be very happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Dr. Skloot, thank you so much. Um, everyone, if you'd like to, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box. While we're uh, giving whenever, everyone else a chance to put a question in if you have one. I have a couple. Okay. So do you, do you recommend learning or, or in practicing diaphragmatic breathing? And would you think that would be helpful? I'm sorry, Jerry, you kind of went out a little bit there. I heard something about practicing breathing, but I didn't hear what was in between. I'm getting, we're getting a lot of background. Here. A lot of static. I may have just missed it in your talk because of my hearing. I don't catch everything. And, but um, so I I went through a uh, pulmonary rehab um, program for quite a few weeks, a couple of months. And uh, that was helpful. And then I also you know, regularly uh, practice diaphragmatic breathing. And I think for me, it seems to really help a lot. And, uh, and I don't know what, I think it's difficult to always um, realize what is helping you is one not as, and what is not, just as you mentioned how it's difficult to diagnose wh what the problem is sometimes, if it's your heart, your lung or something else. So in my case, I'm, you know, I'm choosing between heart problems with, which ended up in a heart transplant and lung disease and, and, it don't, and, and sedentary uh, lifestyle from all of the other symptoms we have. It was really hard to figure out, but my philosophy was just do everything and see, and see what helps. But um, since I had my heart transplant, I realized, or, I, or we've shown in pulmonary function tests that my um, pulmonary function increased, got a lot better after my transplant because of, or assuming better perfusion. So getting more blood and oxygen into my lungs, which is giving my um, lungs a chance to, uh, to improve. 
So that is uh, uh, really uh, good for me. So let me comment on that excellent point. So pulmonary rehab is very, very useful for uh, patients with all kinds of lung disease. It's usually um, instituted when patients have significant problems. So if somebody has mild obstructive lung disease, they don't generally get enrolled in a pulmonary rehab program. If they're um, a transplantation candidate um, and they have pulmonary dysfunction, they absolutely will be involved in a pulmonary rehab uh, program. My patients with COPD, um, many of them were referred, COPD chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, were referred for pulmonary rehab and diaphragmatic breathing and just practicing that breathing, uh, pursed lip breathing uh, was very helpful to them. And one reason, you know, also that um, with a heart transplant, if you had cardiac dysfunction, that lung function can improve after is that uh, with heart dysfunction, when the heart doesn't beat as well and the blood backs up, it backs up um, into the vessels in the lungs and those engorged vessels, if you will, can actually press on the airways and could contribute to airway narrowing. Thank you. So the other, um, at what level do people usually, uh, the only number I'm really that familiar with is the FEV1 score, because that's what the military focused on. And I think I got down under, um, I think I was about 40, 40 to 45 when I did the um, pulmonary function, the rehab rather. What level of, of if I don't know if just FEV1 can, if you can respond to that, but what level is the level that you would normally do something like that? So uh, FEV1 of 45% uh, predicted, because that's what you, I just wanna make sure everyone understands. So when it's a percent, it's a percent of predicted, what's predicted for someone of your sex, of your height, of your age, of your race. So a value of 45% of predicted would be severely reduced. So anyone in that category would be eligible uh, for pulmonary rehab. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody with an FEV1 greater than 80% predicted will not go for pulmonary rehab. Somebody who um, is between 50 and 65 percent predicted, that's the moderate range. Um, it's really going to depend, to depend on where they are in that range, what their symptoms are, what their functionality is, and perhaps, you know, what, what are their other lung function parameters like? Because sometimes you can have an FEV1 that's moderate, but your gas exchange parameter can be severely reduced, and then you're very limited in your functional abilities and pulmonary rehab um, might be very helpful. So it's not just the level of dysfunction, it's how the person feels because there are people walking around with FEV1s that are very reduced and they say they feel fine. So it's really looking at the whole person. Um, I hope that answers your question. All right, yes, thank you. Don, do you have a, uh, and, and before I move on, great presentation, by the way. Um, I really learned a lot. And Don, do you have uh, questions from the group? Welcome, Don. I sure do. Uh -huh. Thank you. Great talk. I missed like the introduction part, but I got disclosures on, so I'm feeling good. Uh, so, good I'm all good then. <laughs> um, the first question comes from uh, Julie in the audience. She says, can GB3 deposited in lung tissue show up on CAT scan? The case presentation sounds similar to what my 16 year old has been experiencing over the last three to four years. She's a competitive hockey player and so is in great shape, but has exertional shortness of breath, tightening and pain in her chest. She was referred to a pulmonologist who denies her having asthma. She is awaiting a more specific test because of COVID, they've not been able to do it for the last two years. Moving forward, can you recommend what I should be asking him to do? And may I share your info with him? 
Also, he does not want her using her puffer because asthma is denied, but she says it helps her during physical exertion. So it's a lot of things to unpack, but. <laughs> so I, I, I cannot give medical advice. Um, so let me just say that as a disclaimer because I'm not this individual's physician. So I cannot give personal um, medical advice, but I guess the things that I would ask the doctor uh, are number one, how has the doctor ruled out asthma? I mean, presumably the doctor has taken a good history and asked all the many questions that one asks of a, a patient who has asthma. And you can have Fabry plus asthma. I had quite a few patients uh, like that, but there is a very detailed history that goes along with, with that. It would take me a good 30 minutes to describe that. Um, to you now, a uh, physical exam and, and certain maneuvers on physical exam with breathing maneuvers can be helpful. I hope that they got um, baseline spirometry, at least. I hope that they were able to safely do that. You know, there are home, there are home spirometers. So I would ask the doctor, is it possible to get a home spirometer so that and then transmit that to the doctor if that hasn't been done. Um, and if it's possible, I would ask the doctor if upon doing spirometry, either safely in the office or at home, if um, then you could administer two puffs of albuterol and repeat that spirometry 15 to 20 minutes later to see if there's a component of reversibility. I'm speculating that the test that they're waiting for is something called a methacholine challenge. That's the diagnostic test for asthma. If it's negative, it rules out asthma with a high degree of certainty. The only data that's been published on methacholine and Fabre that I uh, can refer to was a study done in 1997 by Brown and colleagues at Mount Sinai it's a small group, I'm gonna say approximately 10 patients, and they all had negative methacholine um, challenges. I'm guessing that's the test that the doctor has not been able to do because it takes about an hour. It's a, re a series of repeated spirometry maneuvers after inhaling this drug methacholine, which causes the airway smooth muscle to contract in people who are sensitive to it particularly asthmatics. Um, I would see if the doctor has the capability to do tests of small airways function. And I guess I would just review the, with the doctor all of the tests um, that have been done and that can be safely done at this point. And you asked if you could share uh, my information. Um, I think this information, Jerry, you can correct me, but I believe it's going to be published on the on the website, so it will be uh, made available to the side set. We, we publish the uh, recording so people can go back to the recording and look at the slides. So then they should be available um, to share and, with the Yeah, and here are the, here are the presentation and look at the slides, yes. I hope I've answered, I, I answered the question as completely as I, I could at this point without being um, the 16 year old's medical provider. Yep, that was great. Um, one quick part of that question was, can GB3 deposit in the lung oh, tissue? Yes. Yes. yes, thank you. I remember hearing that and thinking, wow, that's, that's a really great question. So you, you're, not going to, you're not going to see the GB3 itself directly on the CAT scan, but what you will see potentially are the effects of the accumulation of GB3. So, you know, with the really good CAT scans that we can do now, depending upon where it's depositing, you can measure the thickening of the airway wall. You can see on CAT scans if the airway walls are thickened. You can see if there's interstitial lung disease, like I showed you that white haziness. You can see that mosaic pattern that I mentioned was like a 
contrast of white areas and black areas that tells you that there's a small airways pattern. So there's no scan where GB3 will light up on its own, but the effects of GB3 can be seen uh, very nicely with structural changes on the CAT scan. Maybe, maybe there will be technology where GB3 will light up in the future, but I know of nothing like that um, to, to date. Okay, thank you. Um, next question from Lori. Dr. Sklut, I've been on ERT for 15 years. I'm 65 years old. The last two colds I have have consistently turned into terrible coughing fits, almost leading to breathlessness. Breathlessness. Could this change possibly due to Febre? So I guess I would, I wish I knew what your lung function um, was like. I can tell you that that scenario um, happens in, in folks without Febre. I saw many, many people who when they, they got a cold, it would turn into a prolonged event with coughing and shortness of breath that would last for a while. I did find it more commonly in people who had underlying obstructive lung disease. So I would say that it, you could absolutely see this with Fabre. And you know, that's why I always advise my patients uh, with Fabre to take cautions, particularly in cold and flu season to receive the influenza vaccine. But I would think that even with enzyme replacement therapy, this could certainly potentially be related to your Fabre. Uh, next question. Have you found that Fabre patients with normal oxygenation have issues with ventilation requiring BiPAP for hypercapnia? Can this be corrected with inhaled steroids? Well, that's quite a question. <laughs> I mean, that's a good nurse question right there. I wouldn't have to uh, tease that apart. So um, I'm, I'm going to answer the question this way. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, if there's deposition of glycosphingolipid in the upper airway, there can be sleep disordered breathing. Uh, there could be obstructive sleep apnea. There's also been uh, some association with um, central sleep apnea, and this might possibly be related to underlying heart disease or renal disease in February. Um, these individuals may have elevated um, carbon dioxide levels. These individuals might uh, benefit from BiPAP. Um, they could have normal daytime oxygen saturation, but they could have reduced oxygen saturation um, at night. Respiratory muscle weakness is not really a feature of Fabre per se. I saw patients with other lysosomal storage diseases, um, for example, Pompeii, and they had um, issues with respiratory muscle weakness. And I, I saw many more of those uh, patients who required um, the help of uh, you know, uh, external ventilation with something like BiPAP. I hope that answers the question. That's great, thank you. Uh, we've got a question from Nathaniel. Would history of pneumothorax in a Fabry patient itself give you concern for increased lung involvement in the future? So that was, um, that was something I didn't mention at the very beginning when I was going over um, the symptoms. I mentioned hemoptysis, which was the coughing up of blood, and I said it was quite rare. So I did not, I purposely did not mention pneumothorax, although it has been reported because it's, uh, it's very rare and I didn't, did not want to cause alarm. But since you raised, since you raised the point, um, it, it can be seen in Fabry disease. And yes, that would make me think uh, much more of obstructive lung disease. I would expect to see it more in obstructive lung disease. Um, I saw it moving, taking a step away from, from Fabry for a second, I saw it quite a bit in my patients who had emphysema, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and emphysema, they would present with uh, pneumothorax. So it is, if you see that in a patient with Fabry, I would definitely wanna know 
what their underlying lung function was, and I would be thinking about obstruction. Sure. So if an individual was other, we had pneumothorax on one side and was found otherwise to be healthy and young, even though they had Fabry disease, would that increase your worries if everything else turned out fine uh, when they were a teenager, as opposed to now when they're older? So uh, it's another uh, tough, this audience asked very good and very tough questions. Well, you know, I would always worry about a patient who had a pneumothorax and take special care um, with them. But you know, and we should probably point out that young, healthy males who are tall um, can present with a spontaneous pneumothorax. So a spontaneous pneumothorax doesn't always have to be associated with Fabre disease. But if somebody had Fabre and had a pneumothorax, I would probably link the two in my mind. If they were otherwise healthy and they had no other symptoms, I would still recommend yearly pulmonary evaluations for them. And I would want to know their, their lung function. Um, so I would just monitor them. Um, I know that one of the things we have in our recommended schedule of assessments for Fabry disease is pulmonary function tests with spirometry. Um, I think, you know, just from what I'm getting from your case presentation is, is that there are other tests that might be good add-on tests for somebody in that case. What would you order next if you were monitoring somebody long-term who did have normal spirometries with and without bronchodilator? Right. So, well, if I were seeing a new patient with Fabry disease, um, I would get spirometry. If it were normal, I might not get a bronchodilator at that visit. I would get lung volumes and I would get the diffusing capacity to look at the gas exchange. I would get all of that. If all of that was normal, I, I had at my disposal impulse oscillometry. That's not available everywhere, but it's more and more available um, in the United States. It's widely available in Europe, but there are more and more centers that have it. And it's such an easy test because you know, if you're short of breath, if you're tired, you don't feel well, all you have to do is breathe quietly and then you'll get information about small and large airways function. So I would do that to see if there was some early detection of small airways disease. And then I would wanna know about their symptoms. If they, were, if they had no symptoms at all, I would just follow them at that point. If they had exercise related symptoms, I would do an, an exercise study, a cardiopulmonary exercise study like I did in the case I presented. And of course, they would also be concurrently seen by a cardiologist who would run all the cardiology tests and they would have a full laboratory evaluation because renal dysfunction can also contribute to shortness of breath, for example. But that would be how I would proceed. Thank you, that's really helpful. Um, and waiting for some other questions to come in. But in the meantime, I wondered if you could say a little bit more about um, sleep apnea and Fabry disease and what you've seen there. I know you said it could be a whole other talk, but maybe some good take home points on that. Sure. Um, so I'm trying to think back to my Fabry patients who had um, sleep apnea, but I can talk about sleep apnea in general and it should be just as treatable in Fabry disease as it is in patients who don't have Fabry disease. So um, in sleep apnea, what happens is that the, the upper airway, the, the muscles sort of lose tone um, and they especially lose tone at night when you sleep because everything sort of relaxes when you sleep. And so in patients who have sleep disordered breathing, the upper airway tends to collapse and close while they're asleep. When it closes, there's complete cessation of airflow. So there's no airflow. And in that brief second or two, there is no oxygen. So what happens is that that's obviously not a good thing. So there's a signal to, um, you know, neurologic signal saying, wake up. And the patient will wake up. They're often not even aware of it. And they'll start breathing again. They'll start the air will start flowing, the oxygen will come up. And this can happen many, many times during the night and lead to restless and restless sleep that's not restorative. So the most common treatment for sleep apnea 
is uh, CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure or BiPAP. And that involves wearing um, a mask um, at night when you sleep. It could be over just the nose, it could be over the mouth and nose, and it basically blows pressurized air in to the upper airway to stent the airway open, to keep it open so that you don't have those episodes of airway closure. Now, there are other ways to treat it too. There, depending upon someone's oral structure, sometimes people have a structure where a dental device can be made and that can keep the airway open. And most recently I heard about an actual pacemaker. We have pacemakers for the heart. There are pacemakers that could be inserted in the uh, glossopharyngeal muscle, so for the tongue, to, to keep the tongue from falling backward and blocking the uh, airway. And as I mentioned, uh, the, the treatment should work just as well in Fabry disease, but I did not, um, I did not focus on that. So I, I can't really present any, any data on that tonight, but I hope I've given you a good overview. Yeah, that's great. And that, uh, that respiratory pace. Sounds I have good. a comment about um, sleep apnea. So several years ago, we, we put uh, questions in our patient reported, one of our patient reported outcome surveys about sleep studies and sleep apnea. And what we found was that an abnormally high percentage of people with fibro disease have sleep apnea, and many of them are using CPAPs. And um, we also asked how many people um, had, had sleep studies. So in addition to or an already recognized population, or a, a lot of people had not had a sleep test. So we mentioned everyone to you know, go ask your doctor about it because in, in my personal case, my brother tested, uh, had a sleep study and had sleep apnea. And I didn't really have any signs of sleep apnea, but I said, what the heck, I'm gonna go get a sleep study. And, and I in fact had sleep apnea and I stopped breathing 22 times an hour um, when I was tested. So I used the CPAP for years only to find out that later I, just, I had a second, uh, another sleep study, and we realized that my sleep apnea is positional. So I don't really have to use a sleep uh, CPAP. I have a special pillow that straps to my back that keeps me from rolling over at night. So as long as I sleep on my side, I do not have sleep apnea, which well, was two interesting things in, the, in, that, uh, in that story. It's very interesting. I would say that when they did your sleep study, they should have discovered that because um, you know, they, they assess the position in which right. you sleep. Um, Perhaps the uh, change, I don't know. Um, I, I will also say two things, very easy to do a sleep study and um, at home sleep studies are very, very prevalent now. So you don't have to worry about coming into the hospital and you know, risking things like COVID. Um, we used to, it was a small device that we would send home with the patient. It was very easy to, to put on and we would get the data back uh, the, next, the next day. And it was a very good screening tool. And then I also wanted just to comment on your positional sleep apnea. Um, probably before they had special pillows, what people would do is that they would sew a tennis ball into their pajama top. Um, and then every time they rolled over on their back, it would be so uncomfortable that they would right. automatically switch uh, positions. Right. All right. Like uh, lot. Lot. I do Thank have. Thank you very much. For... Yeah. Jerry, I have one more quick question from Julie. Um, you remember Julie, we just talked to who has her 16 year old. She yeah. has uh, Fabry disease um, and this shortness of breath and tightening and pain in her chest. Uh, she just got diagnosed with COVID. Uh, and so she was asking, you know, is there any specific complications related to Fabre we should be talking about, although she's improving with, now she had had a cough and a sore throat and a headache. Um, is there any, I know that from our work, we didn't find Fabre to be a risk factor unless there was end organ damage, but I wonder if there's anything else you can add in there, um, you know, as this teenager fights COVID. So I would say that 
she should definitely be in touch with the pulmonary specialist. And, you know, I, I would recommend this even if she did not have Fabry, but she had her same breathing problems. I think it's extremely important to be monitored by the pulmonologist very frequently. And what I did during, during the COVID pandemic, I was still at Mount Sinai, so I was treating patients. And so all of my COVID patients who had underlying lung disease, and I'm, I'm presuming that her 16-year-old has some, uh, some lung disease based on what I'm hearing, although I can't know for sure. But with my patients, I talk to them by video every single day. And I had them all by pulse oximeters, which were pretty easy to get. And I wanted to know what their oxygen level was uh, every, every day. So if there's a pulse oximeter in the home, I would use it. There are certain apps that can measure that. Um, I would obviously monitor the fever curve and um, the, the pulse and be aware of, of any symptoms. And I would really insist on like a daily check-in. You know, if the pulmonologist is not able to do that, I would do that with the, the general doctor or with the doctor who takes care of, the main doctor who takes care of um, her child's uh, Fabre. I think it's very, very important. And if, if you have a peak flow meter at home, if, you know, because the asthma was mentioned, I don't know if there's a peak flow meter at home. If you know the baseline peak flow, uh, you could also do a peak flow to see how that compares to normal. I wouldn't do it often so as not to exhaust her child, but it would just be one other parameter to get. But I would just follow her very closely. It sounds like right now she doesn't have um, significant symptoms, but I would advise very, very close uh, follow up and ask to speak to the pulmonologist every day or do a video visit, a short one if they're willing to do that every day until her child turns the corner. Thank you, that's really helpful. All right, I think Jerry, you had, is it announcement? All right, well, that, uh, that was an excellent presentation and the question and answer session, thank you. And thank, thank you. you for Dawn for uh, helping with the questions and um, getting through that process. The next thing we're going to do is uh, while I, I'm gonna pull up my slides to do a few quick announcements. And before, while I'm doing that, Dawn's gonna give you a word to type in the chat box for the prize drawing. So what's our yeah, word? Yeah, I that? sure am. Our word is breathe. Go ahead and put breathe in the chat box. And then our able folks from TIE, I think Brittany's gonna give a random drawing, see who wins our prize this time. So just yes, type in the chat box. At the, the, don't look at the closed captions because it, it captured breeze. And I think your word is breathe, right? <laughs> B-R-E-A-T-H. But either way, it doesn't matter. We'll take anything. So thank you. So put your answers in the chat box. We're going to, if uh, Dr. Skloot will close her slides, I'm going to switch over to mine and give you a, um, and, uh, a few announcements. And Dr. Skloot will be in touch. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. All right, Dawn, can you see my slides? I sure can. All right, let me put it on slideshow. And, um, oops. Oh, something just happened there. I thought it was gonna be easy this time. All right. Um, okay, just a quick, quick uh, few slides. And as I, uh, I mentioned, this is our last meeting of our series. And so we, we originally were trying to get to 21. We ended up with 17, but that's pretty, pretty good going, I think. So we're happy with that. Uh, we're gonna call that great success. So as we do each time we have a meeting, we highlight what industry is doing out there. And this slide hasn't changed a lot. So but uh, you don't have to make notes or remember anything. You can go back to the recording 
And um, let me close a couple buttons in case you can see those when in the recording. But um, and let me close. Okay, so we just tell you what's going on, some of the major things that are going on here in industry, what they'd like you to know about. And of course, Sanofi Genzyme, they have a couple of websites and most of you are uh, probably familiar with them if you are on ERT. And they also have a study called the FD Proof Study. Amicus, they have uh, their primary website and they are uh, working on some new things that we'll uh, post soon. KC is uh, still waiting approval and uh, they have um, their Rethink Fabry website and webinars. So if you're not signed up for those, uh, you might wanna check out the Rethink Fabry website. Avro Bio, Sangamo, 40MT and Freeline, I'll skip the Dorsey for a minute, are all uh, enrolling in clinical trials still. So if you're interested in any of those gene therapy solutions, then you have the information here or, uh, or you can contact us if you can't get in touch with them to learn more about those, um, what those organizations are doing. And the last one, Adorsia, I separated them for two reasons. They're a uh, substrate reduction therapy, potential substrate reduction therapy, and they're no, they're, they were no longer re, recruiting, but now some things have changed and they may be starting up again. I'm, not, I'm unclear of what's going on there, but I think they have to go provide some additional information to the FDA. Uh, it may all be being done with the current uh, people enrolled. So, but we'll announce if there's something new going on there to share with you. So in addition to putting things on the slide here so that you can uh, have a, a, an idea on um, what's going on, you can go back to the recording and look at the links in, in uh, detail. And also I'll show you where to get information on industry programs if you haven't already seen it. So on our website, on the top, www.fabrydisease.org. On the top menu bar, there's a tab called company slash clinic info. And if you select pharma tab, you'll see what's in the bottom right uh, block below. So you'll see a grid square for each of the pharma industry companies. And if you select the read more button at the bottom of each one of those, you'll see uh, a pop-up window will pop up and you'll see resources, uh, uh, many more resources that the, the industry programs with, or partners would like to, for you to know about. So you can find out how to get to their clinical, clinical trial site, uh, different um, resources like videos and infographics and PDFs and that sort of thing. So each organization has a list of things in their, in their grid square. So you can always find that. And we're, we have a couple of new things to post, so you'll see something changing uh, there soon. And then on the bottom right, you'll just see an example of the support organization um, window. And in that, it's changed since I took this screenshot, but there are three NFDF tabs, grid squares in the first places. And the middle one, if you select on that, that's where we've put one of the places we've put all of the recordings for the 2021 video uh, virtual meeting series. So we have to upload, I think they're all uploaded, I think, except for this last one. So we'll get it uploaded, but that's one place you can always go to get the, the links to the recordings. The second place is on the registration website in the archives um, recordings tab, you'll see all the recordings. And the third place is in our uh, NFDF YouTube channel. So you can find those recordings to go back and, and re-watch them or share them um, or you know study them like I do because it's easy to not really um, not really get everything that the speakers are talking about in one in one blast. So it's good to have them to go back and refresh yourself and, and uh, focus on things you weren't focusing on the last time. So the next thing we have is a goodbye message. <laughs> so a good evening message. So this concludes our series for 2021. Thank you all for participating. I think we, uh, we covered a lot of ground in, uh, in this series. 
And so with that, and thank you to Dawn, and thank you to Brittany, and of course, thank you, Dr. Stu. And Dawn, we have a word, have, Jerry. Do uh, you have any final words, Dawn? Yeah, my final word is we have a winner. Our winner is Nadine. Oh, that's right. Oh, yeah. Well, good, yeah. good thing you stopped me. Uh, Happy holidays, Nadine. <laughs> you won. So who, who is our winner? Nadine Brantley. Dean, okay. Dean? We'll no, Nadine. A, Nadine, N-A. Oh, oh, it's Nadine. Okay. Sorry, I got you. I, I knew I didn't recognize that, but I was going to go look it up. All right, Nadine, we'll get you an Amazon gift, gift card in the uh, mail. And happy holidays, Merry Christmas, um, and we'll see you all next time. Good night, everyone. Thanks for all the good questions, everybody. Bye.